Hello everyone, my name is Fadi, and I will be presenting today's uh, webinar on monotonic and cyclic testing with DIC for the calibration of complex springback models. I would like to thank you very much for attending this webinar, and I hope you find it very useful. Before I start with the technical content, I would like to spend two minutes on introducing ourselves. Um, Fadi MT is a material component testing house in South Carolina in the United States. We perform uh, a wide variety of material component testing, um, mostly with optical metrology since about five years. Uh, we distinguish ourselves by focusing on the state of the art facilities and highly skilled personnel who understand uh, material deformation. We integrate digital image correlation and optical metrology almost with all the types of tests that we perform. And also we try to elevate the outcome of conventional testing by going deeper, as well as stretching the limits of what can be done in material testing by going with specialized and custom testing solutions, such as the one that we will present today. Um, what we perform is uh, really covered in this picture to some extent, we, we perform a wide range of tests from the simple tension to the complex cyclic testing to other uh, forms of testing that are needed by different R&D centers for the calibration of complex models. I always like to show a video that demonstrates what we can do. And so this is a nice video showing um, an axial crush test of a high strength steel component, automotive component, um, showing how we can capture the deformation of this uh, particular tube with digital image correlation. Um, this is a quick snapshot of um, our partners and clients. As you can see, we work with a um, majority of automotive OEMs and suppliers. So this represents the majority of our work, but we still work with um, many other customers in other industries like aerospace and, and, and so on. Finally, um, we don't just perform material testing. We go beyond that to cover other sectors or other segments, such as on-site measurement services, typically again with DIC and optical metrology. We design and develop and uh, fabricate custom testing solutions and we do um, a good bit of support for finite element uh, simulations and model calibration uh, please do visit our website for more information about what we can do okay so now back to the technical content of this webinar which is again on um the testing needed for calibrating springback models. And I broke the webinar into maybe three main sections. The first one is an introduction about the topic because it is a very complex topic. So we will talk about springback and the challenges in modeling and um, experimentation for springback. Then we will go into the core of this presentation and that's to introduce the setup and how we integrate it with digital image correlation. And then we will spend the majority of the time on presenting the experimental results for a couple of materials to demonstrate how we can capture the material behavior for two different types of materials, basically aluminum, that's a, of course, low ion modulus material and a high grade or a high strength steel grade. And then we will talk about some additional items to further analyze the results. Um, then we will talk about how we can use such data that we're presenting today to calibrate finite element material cards um, in many um, finite element solvers, particularly for auto form and LS Dyna. And finally, I will mention some notes about 3DDIC versus 2DDIC that we are using in this study. So let's start with spring back uh, background, and that usually starts with sheet metal stamping. Sheet metal stamping is the workhorse of automotive manufacturing for um, the production of uh, body in white 
this is primarily the main technique for uh, producing automotive body panels. Uh, we might see some castings and extrusions, but still stamping is the dominant technique by far. It is low cost and involves very high production rates, and that's why it is very popular. And it allows us to form complex features, and it is still compatible with even the new generations of um, materials such as advanced high strength steels and even um, high strength aluminum alloys. So it's a pretty uh, popular technique. I don't think it's gonna go away anytime soon. Uh, but obviously, just like any other technique, it has some challenges. And I broke it into two um, groups. The first one are the visible challenges or defects, if I may call them. So stampings um, usually involve uh, problems that we can see, such as wrinkling or splits. These are very clear problems um, that are evident and can be um, addressed um, basically during um, the production cycle. However, there are some invisible problems, and those problems can be summed up by spring back related. And that's usually a deviation from the intended shape of the stamped part. Um, warpage, distortion, or a combination of the two. But in essence, it is technically a difference or a deviation from the intended part. And to understand spring back, we need to go back to maybe some simple schematics here. And this is a schematic of a tension sample. Um, if we apply tensile load to the sample and then we let go of that load, so we return the sample to zero load, what we get is spring back. And to better represent it, we go usually to tension stress strain curves or load displacement curves. It doesn't really matter, but any um, loading and unloading curves, such as the curves that I'm showing here, that represents basically uh, what happens during spring back. And I tried to show in this particular plot several grades of high strength steels as an example. And I'm starting from CR4, which is a pretty soft steel that's used for external body panels. And then we go to the dual phase family like DP590, 780, 980, and 1180, and then up to the uh, press hardenable steel uh, 1500. Springback basically is the amount of recovery after hitting the maximum load and trying to achieve uh, and going back to a zero load. And so if I focus on two materials, like the DP590 in purple and the DP1180 in yellow, uh, you can see how the amount of spring back increases significantly as the strength of that material or that grade increases. And this is the essence of the problem of spring back. The problem with spring back is that we've had lots of experience with it, uh, or we do have a lot of experience with it. However, the new generations of steels in particular, um, the advanced high strength steels that go beyond one gigapascal in tensile strength, they just come with a significant amount of spring back um, that is really difficult to deal with. And that is the trend. Um, when we go to even other materials such as aluminum alloys, which are spreading a lot in the automotive sector right now, they have a similar problem from a different angle, and that angle is the lower Young's modulus. So aluminum, regardless of what we do, has one third the Young's modulus for steel. Therefore, even if we use a 300 megapascal grade of aluminum, we are still talking about three times the Young's modulus of a mild steel, and that is also significant. So regardless whether we deal with advanced high strength steels for structural members or aluminum alloys for um, closure members or body closures, we still have a significant problem. And that problem is typically seen in presentations and papers um, in a picture like the one I'm showing here. We have a desired shape and we typically get a totally different or totally warped shape if there's a moderate spring back. And in some cases, there's severe spring back, which means, of course, uh, a big problem. So, what are the practical limitations of that? Um, it is uh, very simple, pretty straightforward. If we have a part that is desired uh, to, to produce, ideally you would make the die to the same exact geometry as that part, and, and, and that would be um, the whole story. 
However, um, this is not the case because in reality we have spring back, which means that this basically relationship is not uh, true anymore. And therefore we need compensation in the die design in order to produce the part that we want. And that invites a lot of um, problems because we are now talking about trial and error. So, in order to do this compensation properly, it is best to do it with um, relying on prediction of spring back in materials. And that means the use of these tools that are available to us right now, the finite element tools. The goal is uh, pretty represented by this nice schematic by autoform. The goal is to minimize the deviation between the desired part and and basically the um, output of the stamping process and to do that efficiently if we can use the right finite element tools to minimize that deviation that would be the ideal case scenario and so in this schematic by auto form we can see how maybe in uh, the first finite element run we have um, significant deviation and then we optimize the die design virtually by finite element simulations and we can minimize that deviation and we continue to minimize it in multiple iterations until we are happy with with the level of deviation then we can go to uh, cutting the dice so basically this is better presented by um, this um, new schematic we have a desired part or component we want to design the die so we bring finite element tools and we start simulating based on a starting design and we keep iterating the process. And that means we change the die design virtually until we achieve the tolerance level that we accept. And then we can send the die as a successful design. We can send it for fabrication and cutting. And that saves a lot of cost. Of course, this is idealistic. That doesn't mean that we can do this in one shot without having to recut the dies. Um, that is understandable, but at least if this process is done properly, then recutting the die is not really a tedious or expensive process that is done in multiple, multiple times, uh, but hopefully done in one time. Now, this story cannot be completed without feeding the finite element stamping simulations the right feedstock, and that feedstock is typically a material model or a combination of material models. And again, material models cannot work by themselves. They need experimental data. So now this story is complete. We need experiments to feed models. We need models to calibrate basically material cards. And then we need the right material cards to iterate to properly design the die. With regards to finite element tools, we have pretty powerful tools out there. We have multiple softwares, commercial softwares that have really good tools. Material models are technically well developed. We have so many researchers out there that have developed really good models that can handle spring back from a technical perspective. But typically the bottleneck is experimentation. Why is that? Because the tests needed to calibrate spring back models are usually complex and also they are not easy to perform or get your hands on. Um, they typically involve compression loading which is not easy to do for sheet metal. Um, it involves cyclic testing, um, tension followed by compression or compression followed by tension, both of which are complex. Again, not easy to achieve. Uh, there are no standards whatsoever for any of these tests that we will describe later today. Um, and so that makes it uh, also harder for people to try to initiate this kind of testing. And finally, there are no standard tools for most of these tests. Um, that means if you um, think of your typical uh, material testing systems that you purchase, um, like um, from Instron or MTS or Zwickol, they typically do not offer standard tooling for these tests that we will describe. And so let's go to the modeling and experimental challenges. And I don't want to go in deep into these complex models because I thought this might take too much time from the essence of this presentation. But I wanted to alert you or to direct you to one of these very popular models, which is called the Yoshida Omori model. 
This is a very robust, very good model, really popular in the literature. Uh, but it is also known, um, in addition to being really good model, it's known to be complex. It involves um, really many um, um, segments. It's actually not really a single model. It is multiple models in a, in a suite. And therefore, calibrating this model requires multiple types of tests. And I will show those uh, tests uh, later on and how they relate to the uh, material card that is using Ayushita Omori model. But for now, I am showing here on this screen four of the main types of tests that are needed to calibrate Ayushita Omori model. The first one is a simple one, of course, monotonic tension testing. And that is pretty straightforward. So it's not really complex. Um, but I wanted to put it here as a reference to the other tests. We go to the second test, which is the one to the right of that test, and that is a load unload test. Not very complex test, um, but it's also not straightforward. And this test is basically loading the sample and then unloading it to zero and then repeating the cycle multiple times. Can be done with most conventional material testing systems, but you also need to worry about how to reverse the load accurately um, so that we can achieve what we want to achieve from this test, as will be discussed later. Then we go to more complex tests, the compression loading test. This is, in essence, or in theory, a simple test that's just a monotonic compression test. However, we are talking here about sheet metals. These are usually two millimeters or thinner, and therefore it is not easy to, it's not possible to compress these samples unless you have a mechanism to prevent buckling. And that's what invites the first complexity for this type of testing. The second complexity comes from the fact that we need compression testing to be accomplished for very large plastic strain. We are not talking about one or two or three percent. We need the plastic strain to be higher, preferably above eight percent. Then we go to the last complex test, which is even uh, more complicated than the compression testing. This is cyclic tension and compression. So we do multiple loops where we go positive, negative, positive, negative, almost like a fatigue test. But again, this is done not um, in the elastic region as fatigue tests are performed. This is done in the plastic zone. And therefore, we are talking about two, four, six, eight percent uh, deformation in, in each direction for every loop. And again, that is not possible without a mechanism to prevent buckling. Um, in your setup. So this takes us to our work today. The custom experimental setup that we developed to address these uh, complex tests. And I wanted to start with a general view of the setup and what it's composed of. Uh, mainly, we have two segments to focus on today. The first one is the core of the experimental setup. And obviously, it's a custom piece. And we call it the anti-buckling device. And we've uh, designed it to uh, accommodate any testing machine so that you can put it on any machine to some extent of any size and, and any capacity. And it has many features and it's designed specifically to address the needs of spring back modeling tests um, that involve basically compressive cycles um, and cyclic um, tension compression um, cycles. Then we go to the second part of this setup, and that is the integration with the IC. The IC is now a very common technique for measurement of strains. So we decided to do uh, an integration here, obviously, to do the strain measurements in a non-contact fashion, uh, although this can be done with uh, maybe other techniques, and it has been shown in the literature to do um, this kind of testing or similar uh, kind of testing with conventional extensometry, we believe that DIC is the perfect tool um, for this kind of testing, given the complexity of the test and the complexity of these setups. So to have non-contact strain measurements is a huge plus. And we will demonstrate here a couple of uh, different ways of integrating DIC. First, we will talk about a 2D DIC system that is fully integrated with the setup to perform all the tests. And then we will even bring a more complex mode here, which is a 3D DIC system that is integrated with the setup in a real-time mode um, to provide a feedback to the testing machine. And we will uh, describe this in more details. But let's start with the anti-buckling device. 
just to um, explain how it works and the main elements of this anti-buckling device. It is simply a mechanism to support the test sample during um, loading so that we don't have uh, buckling and we can accumulate large plastic strains in the compressive stroke. Um, it has a cage basically that houses most of the elements and you can see we have the anti-buckling plates which are responsible to increase the stiffness of the sample um, during testing and to make um, this testing uh, more friendly than what, um, what we are used to before. We decided to make this one pneumatically actuated so you can see the pneumatic cylinder that applies a side load to the anti-buckling plates and that basically exerts a certain amount of force. That force is controlled by the amount of pressure we feed in and it's also measured by an additional load cell which we call the side load cell and it is um, done in two ways either basically open loop or closed loop to provide direct feedback so that you can control the uh, you can adjust the pressure to maintain a certain side force um, at the same time we typically um, fabricate custom grips for this particular type of testing because typical grips cannot be used for this testing um, even if you use hydraulic grips um, you still have another problem which is the fact that hydraulic grips are very large and you cannot use them here uh, because you need to make sure that the spacing between the grips and the uh, gauge region of the sample are um, very small or yeah the spacing is very small we typically leave about five millimeters max so therefore it's best to use custom grips for this kind of testing the entire setup is floating on um, on bearings therefore it is self-centered we don't have to worry about um, the thickness of the sample or how we load the sample once we mount the sample um, the centering is um, is automatic and therefore we don't have any bending effect on the sample and finally we um, bring basically the DIC from either one of the two sides and as you can see DIC will be monitoring the thickness of the sample not the front face of the sample as it is typically done in other tests so um, since I explained all this, I'm going directly to the digital image correlation and integration with this setup. So, as I mentioned earlier, we will uh, present the results from uh, two systems. The main system here is the 2D DIC system that we have fully integrated with the setup. We've, uh, we've decided to go with an extra high resolution um, system um, that allows us to achieve very small pixel resolution or pixel spacing. We, our target is always below 10 microns per pixel for this type of testing since we are monitoring the thickness of the sample or the side of the sample. So um, the camera system that we've picked uh, allows us to go to 6 microns per pixel which is above target and it is done in the conventional mode simply because it's a 2 DIC system. For comparison and for doing something a little bit more uh, challenging, we used 3D DIC um, we use the commercial GOM RMS 12M system. Uh, we use it in a real-time mode to demonstrate what can be done in the real-time mode and what is the advantage of using that if it is available to you. And the idea here is, if you don't have a 3D DIC system, um, we offer the 2D DIC system to fully integrate the setup or basically provide a comprehensive setup. But if you have a 3D DIC system, of course, we encourage you to use it because it allows you or offers you uh, better accuracy and of course allows you to use the setup in real time mode even though as we will show later it's not really necessary to use the 3D DIC system it's just better or nicer and the idea of um, this real time mode or what it means is actually using the DIC system as a, a strain extensometer where you fully integrate it with the testing machine it provides a signal to the testing machine and that signal is used to drive the machine. Basically, you can tell the machine when to reverse loading, especially when we're doing tension followed by compression, we can use the DIC to provide that feedback signal so that the machine knows when to reverse loading um, and, and so on, as we will show later on. So now that we talked about the setup, let's go to some results. We 
picked two materials, as I mentioned earlier, so that we can diversify the results and show the capability here. We picked a pretty uh, popular advanced high sense steel. Um, this is a one gigapascal material, DP980, very, very popular in the automotive sector. And we picked a 1.2 millimeter thickness. Um, the table shows roughly the yield and tensile strength of this material. And most importantly, the total ductility of this material. This is not a very ductile material, so it's pretty challenging to test. In addition to the fact that it's high strength, so that will push stream back uh, really high. The second material we picked is a standard or a typical 6000 series, also automotive grade for external panels. This material has a, a thickness of 2.5. It's pretty thick, but this was available to us and it actually helps us in testing. Um, and it is a bit more ductile than the DP980. So it's nice to show uh, different levels of strength and ductility and Young's modulus for these materials. Let's go to the experimental results and we will start with the simple one. And I will go very briefly with the results here, maybe a couple of slides for each type of testing to highlight what we get out of these tests and how we later use them. The monotonic tension testing is um, doesn't really need to be covered here because it's a very simple test. However, I wanted to cover a very a special mode of this testing, which we usually do and we recommend doing because it's important for subsequent tests, especially compression testing. And that's the evaluation of friction testing. Because we have an anti-buckling device and it's exerting a side force on the sample, that means we are inherently inducing um, frictional forces that cannot be eliminated. And therefore, if you are going to do the compression and cyclic testing that is needed to calibrate a Yoshida model or other models, then you must know how big is the frictional force induced by your fixture. And therefore we do tension testing uh, in a conventional way without any side loading. And then we do it with side loading from the same fixture under the same conditions that we run the other tests. And we take the difference between them as shown in these figures here um, to evaluate the impact of frictional force on the results. And we typically try to use, of course, good lubricants, solid uh, lubricants for the anti-buckling plates. And we typically target less than 2.5% difference um, as a reasonable amount of friction that can be easily corrected uh, once we get the results. And we were able to obtain um, or get to that target um, even better um, for both materials as shown here in these results. And that's basically the essence of what we're trying to do and show here for tension testing. Let's go to the load unload tests. Again, these tests, to, this, to explain them better, um, let's show this video as we explain this test. It's basically a tension test that goes up to a certain um, stress level or strain level, and then the sample is reloaded or unloaded. Then the cycle is repeated again to a higher strain level, and then unloaded, and then this re process is repeated multiple times, as you can see in the video, and that is to achieve basically loading and unloading at different strains. Of course, the more the better, but what you can see here in this video is pretty reasonable. We have about six to 10 steps of unloading in a typical test, and that's more than sufficient to provide us with the, with the number of points that we need for calibration of uh, parts of these models. As I mentioned earlier, this test is not uh, does not require actually an anti-buckling device. However, the load reversal is important, it's critical, and the measurement of the Young's models is very critical throughout the test. So that's why we uh, believe that with DIC, you get an advantage there, and especially in real time, you get an extra advantage that allows you to do this uh, pretty nicely. Results-wise, these uh, two curves here show what Kind of results we get and we plotted these load unload curves against the monotonic curve just to show how they relate to each other of course you see a little bit of deviation with dp980 and that's real life not all samples are exactly the same you see maybe a better fit for the 6016 um, and that happens to be um, slightly more repeatable material even altogether as we notice from other tests the um, cycles that we went with here we start with about 1% increment at the beginning, and then we increase to 2% increment because 
um, that's more than su sufficient later on in the deformation. And we went up to whatever was possible with the material. General rule is you really cannot exceed the uniform elongation of the material. So for, so for the DP980, we went to around 6% um, because the uniform ductility for this material was around 8, while with aluminium we went further to uh, actually more than 8%, but I'm showing here up to around um, 8%. Now, why do we do these tests? The reason we do these tests is because we want to evaluate the Young's modulus and how it changes after every loading and unloading cycle. So we start with a, a base number or a base value for that metal, and then that value changes as we deform the material. And so we try to capture it by doing these loading unloading cycles. And the outcome of those is shown in these two plots for the two materials. Each one of those points represents one of those cycles. And again, we obtain the Young's modulus um, for that um, part of the curve. And we plot it as a function of plastic strain for that point of reversal. And we typically fit it to models such as the one shown here. And that gives us the um, the critical piece of information that we call it the Young's modulus decay with plastic strain. And as I will show later, this is used for the calibration of these spring back models. Let's go to the compression testing. And a nice video to demonstrate how this usually works. Um, it's again simple in principle, but you can see the anti buckling device here in action. We can see the plates. Uh, squeezing the sample in between to prevent it from buckling so that we can get the nice stress strain curve like the one that you see in the video here on the bottom right hand side of the uh, video. That's basically the essence of the test. We typically um, do check for many things. You can see we're checking the side force that it is pretty uniform and we also check on the strain versus time curve and we like it to be as linear as possible. Um, and also we do some other t uh, checks on the sample itself. We take it out of the device after finishing to make sure that we did not exceed the limit of the material um, and that we didn't buckle the material. So this test, we typically try to creep higher and higher in strain until we get some buckling. Um, so the idea is you want to give your finite element people the maximum amount of compressive strain so that you can uh, have a usable stress strain curve such as the ones shown down here. You can see um, we achieved more than 10% and that's typically our target. We like to achieve 10%. Sometimes it's really difficult if you're doing a DP1200, it's really difficult because the material doesn't have enough ductility, but we typically try to shoot for 10% and we get it for most materials and the curves here demonstrate that um, nice results can be obtained if the right amount of side loading is is applied um, and the friction is controlled uh, properly. Um, you can present the results as engineering stress strain curves, but obviously the better one is the true stress strain curves because that's what ultimately feeds into those models. And again, the curves are uh, nicely smooth uh, that can be used for model calibration. Now the more complex or the most complex test, which is the cyclic tension compression testing. And this video clearly demonstrates it. You were just going positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. Um, and every time we increase the amount of plastic deformation, we typically do it in an increment of two to three percent um, in each cycle. So in this video, you can see we went to 2.5, then 5, then 7.5, and so on. So this test, as I mentioned, is the most complex of all. This is the most demanding. Um, what we typically do is we do the other tests first so that we can tune the fixture, identify the amount of side force that is needed to prevent buckling, and then we go with this test. Typically, three loops is more than sufficient. I have not seen any model out there that requires more than three loops. Some people are actually um, actually use two loops and some use a single loop. So if you can do three loops, that's more than sufficient. Um, the curves demonstrate how the fixture or the setup was able to produce very nice results um, all the way to the third cycle. You might see some hiccups 
as the number of cycles increase, but that should not really affect the model calibration process. Um, these curves are, by all intended purposes, um, really nice for what we need uh, in terms of calibration. Okay, so let's go to some additional comments and additional observations. If we take the different types of tests, and I'm going to exclude the load unload because the purpose of it is somewhat different. If we take the tension, compression, and then the cyclic test, and we put them on top of each other, we can learn a lot about the materials that we are dealing with. And it actually allows us to have a, a, a nice image of why these materials are complex. So let's look at the DP980 and the 6016 again here. First, you notice that the blue curve, which is the compressive loading, uh, we just basically flipped it in this case, is slightly higher than the, the black curve, which is the monotonic tension. And that means that we have an asymmetry between the tension and compression. And it's interesting to see how um, it is there. It is notable. It's not small. And that means that, you know, your properties are different whether you consider tension or compression. Uh, note that the yield strength is different for the DP980, where for the aluminium, it's pretty much the same. So they have, the aluminium doesn't show difference in the yield, but it shows difference later on in the curves, and that means the hardening. Both materials uh, show large tension compression asymmetry. And what that means is that after yielding, we are seeing some significant differences um, between the tension and compression and also differences in the way that the material um, re-establishes these cycles or these loops. Let's look at the 6016, for example. If I take the first loop and then reverse it back to compression and then take it back to tension again, we notice that the curves are much higher than the starting curve. So this is the starter curve, which is the black one. That's the monotonic curve. The cyclic loop first follows that black curve, but then it goes much higher and then it goes much higher. That is a very um, unique behavior. Not many materials show this kind of a response, and that is indicative of a strong, uh, basically, um, and complex behavior. Basically, complex behavior and strong um, kinematic hardening in this material. On the other hand, if I looked at the DP980, it feels like all the loops are lining up together right on top of each other. So if I take the first curve, the black curve, the monotonic tension, it feels like all the three orange cycles are lining up with it perfectly as if there's no effect there. However, if I look at the compression cycle after the reversal, we see totally opposite response. The aluminum is showing increase in the yield strength in the return cycle. So that's the first return cycle, and that's the second return cycle, and that's the third one. If I take the yield strength, or what we call it re-yielding, it somewhat goes up, while for the DP980, it decreases. And that is a totally different behavior when we look at the steel and the aluminum here. So you can see these curves when we compare them with each other. They give us a lot of information about these materials and how they behave completely differently. This note about the multiple cycles and how they show us different response is extremely important. And I wanted to highlight it here because I will bring it back again when we talk about the finite element solvers and how they um, use such data to calibrate their models. If I take a look at the first cycle only with both materials, and that is the zone highlighted by this purple box, you can see that I will not see any difference between the DP980 and the 6016, meaning I will not see that increase in the stress level of aluminium after multiple cycles. So if I contain my number of cycles to only one, then I will not see this response very clearly. And that has very strong implications, as we will mention later on, for the calibration of these models. Another thing to look at is the strain distribution. DIC gives us very powerful information beyond any extensometer, and that's what we wanted to bring here. 
whether you use 2DDIC or 3DDIC. At least you have the ability to visualize the amount of deformation in the material and how it's distributed in the material. And this is a snapshot, or these are snapshots taken at different strain levels to demonstrate how non-uniform the deformation in these tests is. It's typically this non-uniform, and you will never be able to get perfectly uniform deformation simply because of the um, extreme amount of um, plastic strain that you're imposing on the material, especially in these cyclic yeah. loads. Um, the second thing DIC will, will give us is also a comparison between different materials. So this is the DP980, and as you can see, it is pretty non-uniform as we start deforming the material, pretty much from the start, while with aluminum, it might be a little bit more uniform, especially in the central zone, until later on um, in the deformation. Okay, so now that we talked about the experiments, the experimental setup, the experiments, and what we get out of these experiments and the stress strain curves of these different loading modes, how does this fit into commercial finite element solvers? Um, let's start with LS Diner and J Stamp for uh, those colleagues who work, um, especially in Japan. Um, Japanese OEMs, I think they use uh, JSTAM, which usually works with LS Dyna. So that's why I combine them together. There are many built in material cards um, in LS Dyna, and they all involve kinematic hardening based on Yoshida Omori model. It's, um, it's like I said earlier, it's pretty popular. And LS Dyna has many material cards that are built on that model. And I'm listing here the most important ones, at least the ones that we could find or we're familiar with. Uh, you might find more, but these are pretty much comprehensive. And you can see they all use the Yoshida Omori model plus some different versions of the isotropic yield function. So, for example, you can see MAT125 uses Hill48, while MAT226 uses Barlat with three parameters. Uh, 242 goes with a more complex, basically, form of bar lab, which is with eight parameters and so on. Um, MAT 287. MAT 287 is a special material card developed by JSOL um, to work with Dyna as a solver, and it uses basically Yoshida Omori model with the uh, Hill 48 based on three R's. For any one of those material cards, um, you have many, many parameters to calibrate. And I'm listing here just the parameters that are needed uh, for a uh, MAT-125. When you go to 287 and um, 226, the number of parameters uh, could be higher. And so, as you can imagine, that's one of the reasons why springback modeling is uh, not really uh, simple. It's complex and requires a lot of work, both experimentally and calibration-wise, and then finite element. But regardless what? This mapping of LS Dyna material card parameters to uh, the YU model is available and can be obtained. Um, and we're trying to develop actually a, a nice summary of that for uh, the different types of material cards that we calibrate. Now, to calibrate such a model, any one of those material cards would require pretty much the same type of tests. And that is almost the uh, everything we cover today. So that's the monotonic tension, the load unload and the cyclic testing. Compression testing is not necessarily needed for the Ishida Omori model. It just provides extra information about the asymmetry in the material. But that being said, um, what I'm showing on the screen might not be sufficient even. First, the tension testing, as we showed earlier, uh, we always recommend to do it with and without friction so that you can use that for correcting the other stress strain curves. Also, this tension testing must be performed in three directions if you're using a nice um, an isotropic yield function that accounts for that. So that is on the tension side. With the cyclic tension and compression testing, um, you can see right now I'm showing the typical curves that I presented earlier, which are tension followed by compression. There are some people in the literature who can or who like to calibrate for compression um, followed by tension. Basically, you start in the compression cycle and then you reverse and do the multiple loops. And I'm showing here 
two sets of curves for the same material. This is another DP980, um, and it shows tension followed by compression, uh, which is in orange, versus compression followed by tension, which is purple. The idea here to show that you can do both ways, no problem, but the idea here is to show that materials will show difference in their response, whether you start with tension or compression. And that's just basically the nature of these materials. And then finally, beyond all these tests for really proper calibration of these models, especially if you're using a nice anisotropic yield function, you still need an additional test that is not really related to this topic uh, or not related to these tests uh, that are really planar. And that test is the hydraulic bulge test, which is a balanced by axial test that is needed to calibrate one of the anisotropic yield function parameters, uh, typically for Barlat. So with all this, if you're running an LS Dyna or JSTAM, basically these are the type of tests that you need to cover, and we've talked about them all except the bulge testing, which we will cover in another webinar. Now, um, obviously this is very complex. Not all people use all of them. You can use simplified versions of the Yoshida Omori model to reduce the number of parameters that you're calibrating. And, and we have to be very careful here. What do we mean by simpler? Uh, it means you can actually turn on or off certain parameters if you think the model is not really sensitive to them for that particular material. So, for example, you could, for some people, um, do not use the Young's modulus decay um, in, in the model, um, and so on. Um, so, it is possible that you use simpler versions of it. But I wanted to highlight a very interesting work. There are several works in the literature, but one of them uh, was done just a few years back by uh, Ming Shi, um, and it really highlights the importance of incorporating multiple cycles, not a single cycle, um, as well as the decay of Young's modulus. They, they showed how if you don't account for that, if you don't account for the decay in Young's modulus, and if you don't use multiple cycles for the calibration of your uh, model, you will not get a good fit to spring back prediction, or you, you will not get a spring, good spring back prediction in, in, in the ultimate, basically, simulations. Uh, they saw a lack of predictability by the finite element uh, simulations. And this takes me back to the previous comment when I mentioned those multiple loops and how sometimes in the literature you will see uh, the use of a single loop or sometimes half a loop um, of a tension compression test to do the calibration or the fitting. So that is just something interesting to, to mention here. And finally, if you're using Dyna, that doesn't mean that you're stuck with Yoshida Omori model. You could use simpler models. Um, there are some material cards built in for non-Yoshida Omori model, like the MAT-165. And also, as you know, with Dyna, you can still write your own user-defined subroutine for any model of your choice. But regardless what, most of the time, you are going to use some of those tests that we presented today. Let's go to Autoform, and that's where we, um, as you know, if you are a user of Autoform, uh, Autoform is a typically a closed box software, so uh, you cannot write um, a subroutine, as far as I understand it, very easily, uh, but there is a, a built-in kinematic hardening model. It is not the Yoshida Omori model, as far as I know. It is some proprietary model for Autoform, and it is simpler in general, uh, if I may describe it as so, because it doesn't require the same experimental results that we typically uh, see required for Yoshida Omori. And it is simply summarized uh, by those two curves here. The first one is tension testing, also done in three orientations. And the second one is tension followed by compression, for only half a cycle, as shown exactly in this in this plot, and typically they require a minimum of five or six percent. Uh, finally, for abacus and any other solver, uh, there are no built material cards in abacus for for this purpose. But obviously, with abacus, it's an open platform, so you can write your UMAT and uh, feed in any model, whether it's Yoshida Omori or any other model. And therefore. The same types of tests are applicable here, um, and that's mainly the tension um, and or compression, the Young's modulus decay, and then the cyclic loading.
final remarks, I wanted to go address the topic of 2D versus 3D just very, very briefly. This is a topic that we've started talking about in a previous webinar, I think in March or April. We discussed how 2D DIC can be sufficient for stream measurements in cases where you have in-plane deformation. And this is a case, of course, uh, here of in-plane deformation. We have tension, compression, cyclic loading, we are mainly in-plane. So we felt that you could use 2D DIC for, uh, for strain measurements. And like I said earlier, we typically, when we develop this um, testing system, we integrated a 2D DIC system with it because we zoomed it in. We uh, used a good camera, good optics, so that we can zoom in and obtain a very high pixel resolution. The idea here is if you are going to do these tests, you need a DIC. If you don't have a 3D DIC system, then you could use a 2D DIC system uh, quite sufficiently. And we will show more and more results on this particular topic from this particular setup in a future webinar, which will take place actually next month. So it's just a few weeks away. But for today, I wanted to show some highlights on how the results compare between 2D and 3D DIC system. And the first one is obviously the tension curves. Um, this is a simple case we've presented earlier and um, it's a very straightforward comparison. You will get very, very comparable results between 2D and 3D DIC to the point that it doesn't really make any difference whatsoever. When you go to cyclic testing, of course, it's a little bit more complex. Nevertheless, um, I'm showing you some curves where you can barely see any difference between the hardening curves uh, from 2D or 3D DIC. You will see a little bit of deviation towards the end. And that doesn't really affect the calibration much. For people who worked with Yoshida Omori model, when you take experimental curves and you try to calibrate them, you will see that your model fit to the experimental results will show way more deviation than what I'm showing here. And we've tried this multiple times. It doesn't really affect the parameters that much when you show or, or when you get such a difference, a uh, small difference in the strains between the two. We even repeat the tests multiple times. And here I'm showing two repeats on top of each other. And you can see the same exact trend, um, almost indistinguishable. When we go to compression testing, we noticed a little bit higher levels of deviation. And I'm showing here the results for compression um, where you might think that this difference is significant, but it's still not significant. Why? Because um, ultimately from compression testing, what you care about is the hardening curve, um, the uh, properties in compression, which is yield and N value and so on. So we extracted those properties for these two curves or two sets of curves that you see here. And you can um, uh, easily see that the difference in yield strength is, is not much. The N value is, um, is almost the same and the K value is slightly different, but it still doesn't affect the overall scheme of calibration for these tests. Finally, I'm showing a video here that is from a 3D DIC measurement because we wanted to measure the out of plane deformation. So basically, of course, we measure the stresses and strains. Um, we apply the virtual section in the middle of the sample. And we show the uniformity of this section deformation. It's pretty uniform except for the far ends, which don't really matter. So in the middle, it's pretty okay, pretty good. Now, if I look at the section delta Z, which is the blue curve, and I play it one more time, it starts with zero and then goes to a maximum of about 0.15 millimeter. So that's all the out of plane deformation that you are going to see in a test like this, especially when we take it to um, a high level of strain like 8% or so. And so um, this is just like I said, a teaser for later on, um, we will present a very comprehensive study on how 2D DIC measurements compare to 3D DIC measurements. And again, the idea is to show people that if you are not a DIC user, we definitely strongly recommend that you become a user of DIC. If you cannot get your hands on a 3D DIC system, if what you're doing in your, um, in your lab is really limited to in-plane deformation, then a 2D DIC system will do very nicely, very well, and that will get you going with uh, a very nice measurement technique. 
And like I said, uh, we would love to see you in this webinar in, at the end of July so that we can show you results from uh, a nice study for different loading cases. This was my last slide. I would like to thank you again uh, so much for attending this webinar. Um, and I wanted to open the room for some questions. Um, I'm putting here my personal email address, and of course, you can go to our website and enter some other questions about this topic or any other topic. But for today, I saw a couple of questions coming in, so I will try to address them right now. And if I don't, if I don't have enough time, I will be sure to send some results uh, by email later on. Thank you so much. Okay, so the first question we got today is um, during a compression testing or during compression testing, uh, did the developed design for the fixture maintain the uniaxial strain condition? The answer is yes. We can see that from the stress strain curves. Of course, that's a global measurement, but also clearly we can see it from our DIC measurements because the strain maps allow us to see how much strains are developed in the other direction. And we actually have some nice um, strain maps that show the uniformity of the loading um, and we can easily share those results um, if you are interested in that. Another question that came in is, uh, what do you think of Shaposh model compared to Yoshida? To be honest, I don't have a lot of experience with Shaposh model. I've seen it used a couple of times. In fact, the material card that I mentioned earlier as a special material card in LS Dyna that doesn't use Yoshida model, uh, MAT 165 is actually based on Shabosh uh, model or hardening model. So um, that is already built into Dyna, so it must be uh, a good card. However, based on my humble interaction, there, um, there are way more users out there that I've seen that use uh, one of those uh, Dyna cards with Yushida Omori. Again, I'm not saying that Yushida Omori is necessarily better. It's just I see way more people using Yushida Omori than Shabosh model, if that makes um, sense. So like 125 is very widely used, um, especially here in North America. And of course, 287 is widely used in Japan and Asia. Um, and overall, if uh, I look at the global, uh, basically, research arena, uh, I see a lot of people doing uh, or using Yushida Omori. Okay, we have a couple of other questions, but now it is uh, time to conclude this webinar. So as I promised, I will send um, an email with answers to those questions. And again, please feel free to um, send more questions about this topic or other topics. Um, and we hope to see you in a future webinar. Thank you again for your attendance, and I wish you a nice day or evening wherever you are. Thank you.